Chapter Seventeen of The Dude Wrangler by Caroline Lockhart. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Seventeen, Counting Their Chickens. The happy family of the Colonial had decided to make up a congenial party and spend the remainder of the summer at the Lolabama Ranch in Wyoming. They were expected on the morrow. Everything was in readiness for their coming, and, after supper, down by the corrals, Wally and Pinky sat on their heels, estimating their probable profits. Pinky's forehead was furrowed like a corrugated roof with a mental effort as he figured in the dust with a pointed stick, while Wally's face wore a look of absorption as he watched the progress, although he was already as familiar with it as with his multiplication tables. Ten head of dudes at one hundred dollars a month is a thousand dollars, said Pinky, and twelve months in the year times a thousand is twelve thousand. And, say, Wally interrupted, but I've told you a dozen times they all go south in the winter. The most we can count on is two months now and perhaps more next summer. Pinky replied confidently, you can't figure out ahead what a dude is going to do any more than a calf or a sheep. If we treat em right and they get stuck on the country, they're liable to winter here instead of Florida. Now, if we could winter, say, ten head of dudes at 150 a month for seven months, that would be 10,500. The trip through Yellowstone Park and Jackson Hole Country is going to be a big item. Ten head of dudes, say, at five dollars a day for, say, fifteen days, is. But you never deduct expenses, Pinky. It isn't all profit. There's the interest on the investment, interest on the money we borrowed, groceries, the cook's wages, and we'll need helpers through the Yellowstone. You're getting an awful habit of looking on the black side of things, said Pinky crossly. If we can pay expenses and have a thousand dollars clear the first year, I'll be satisfied. A thousand dollars, Pinky exclaimed indignantly. You're easy pleased. I thought you had more ambition. Look at the different ways we got to get their money. Two bits apiece for salt water baths and eight baths a day. Some of them might not go in regular every day, but say, eight of them do. Anyway, eight times two bits is two dollars. Then ten dollars apiece every time they go to town in the stagecoach is, say, one hundred dollars a trip. And they go twice a week, say, that's two hundred dollars. But they might not go twice a week, Wally protested, nor all of them at a time. You sure give me the blues a croaking. Why don't you look on the bright side of things like you used to? Do you know I've been thinking we ought to make out a scale of prices for letting them work around the place. They'd enjoy it if they had to pay for it. Dudes is like that, I've noticed. They're all pretty well fixed, ain't they? Oh, yes, they all have a good deal of money. Unless, perhaps, Miss Eister, and I don't know much about her in that way. But Mr. Penrose, Mr. Apple, and Mr. Budlong are easily millionaires. Pinky's eyes sparkled. I suppose a dollar ain't any more to them than a nickel to us. Wally endeavored to think of an instance which would indicate that Pinky's supposition was correct, but, recalling none, declared enthusiastically, They are the most agreeable, altogether delightful people you ever knew, and, if I do say it, they think the world of me. That's good. Maybe they won't deal us so much grief. How grief? Misery, Pinky explained. I can't imagine them doing anything ill-natured or ill-bred, Wally replied resentfully. You must have been unfortunate in the kind of dudes you've met. Pinky changed the subject as he did when he was unconvinced, but he was in no mood for argument. He climbed to the top pole of the corral fence and looked proudly at the row of ten-by-twelve tents 
which the guests were to occupy, at the long tar-paper room built on to the original cabin for a dining-room, at the new bunk-house for himself and Wally and the help, at the shed with a dozen new saddles hanging on their nails, while the ponies to wear them milled behind him in the corral, his eyes sparkled as he declared, We sure got a good dudin' outfit, but it's nothing to what we will have. Watch our smoke. The day'll come when we'll see this country, as you might say, lousy with dudes. So fur as the eye can reach. Dudes. Nothing but dudes. He illustrated with a gesture so wide and vigorous that if it had not been for his high heels hooked over a pole, he would have lost his balance. Yes, Wally agreed, complacently. At least we've got a start, and it seems like a good sign. The luck we've had in picking things up cheap. Instinctively, they both looked at the old-fashioned four-horse stagecoach that they had found scrapped behind the blacksmith shop in Prouty and bought for so little that they had quaked in their boots lest the blacksmith change his mind before they could get it home. But their fears were groundless, since the blacksmith was uneasy from the same cause. They had had it repaired and painted red with yellow wheels that flashed in the sun. And now there it stood, the last word in the picturesque discomfort for which dudes were presumed to yearn. They regarded it as their most valuable possession since, at ten dollars a trip, it would quickly pay for itself and thereafter yield a large return upon a small investment. Neither of them could look at it without pride, and Pinky chortled for the hundredth time. It sure was a great streak of luck when we got that coach. Wally agreed that it was, and added, Everything's been going so well that I'm half scared. Look at that hotel range we got second hand, as good as new, and the way we stumbled onto a first-class cook, and my friends coming out. It seems almost too good to be true. He drew a sigh, which came from such contentment as he had not known since he had come to the state, for it seemed as if he were over the hard part of the road, and on the way to see a few of his hopes realized. With the money he had collected from Canby, he had formed a partnership with Pinky, whereby the latter was to furnish the experience and his services as against his, Wally's, capital. Once more the future looked roseate, but perhaps the real source of his happiness lay in the fact that he had seen Helene Spensley and Prouty a good bit of late and she had treated him with a consideration which had been conspicuously lacking heretofore. If he made a success, she must take him seriously, and, anyway, his train of thought led him to inquire, Don't you ever think about getting married, Pink? His partner regarded him in astonishment. Now, wouldn't I look comical tied to one of them quails I see running around proudy? But... Wally persisted. Some nice girl. Ah, I'd rather have a good saddle horse. I had a pal that tried it once, and when I seen him, I says, How is it, Jess? He says, Well, the first year is the worst, and after that, it's worse and worse. No, sir. Little Pinky knows when he's well off. It was obvious that his partner's mood did not fit in with his own. The new moon rose, and the crickets chirped as the two sat in silence on the fence and smoked. It's a wonderful night, Wally said, finally, in a hushed voice. It's plum peaceful, Pinky agreed. I feel like I do when I'm getting drunk, and I've got to the stage where my lip gets stiff. I've always wished I could die when I was like that. Wally suggested curtly. Let's go to bed. He had regretted his partner's lack of sentiment more than once. Time to get into the feathers if we make an early start. Pinky unhooked his heels. Might have a little trouble hitching up. The two broncs I aim to put on the wheel has never been drove. End of chapter 17